Hi, my name is Wesley Morgan. I'm a lecturer in international affairs at the University of the South Pacific, uh, based in Suva in the Fiji Islands. I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be there with you at the conference today, but I have prepared a short video presentation that I hope you will find provocative. Uh, my research explores the agency of Pacific Island countries in multilateral regimes in, for example, uh, global trade negotiations at the World Trade Organization and in climate negotiations at the UNFCCC. And of course today we're interested in Pacific Island countries uh, and their engagement in global efforts to tackle climate change. Most people know that Pacific Island countries are uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Things like stronger cyclones, changing rainfall patterns, uh, sea level rise. But today I want to talk about Pacific Islands as key agents in global efforts to tackle climate change, as key actors in global diplomacy who are helping to frame issues and set the agenda for international cooperation to tackle the climate crisis that we all face. As you no doubt know, Fiji is currently president of the 23rd Conference of Parties uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So that provides some context for my remarks. But I want to give, provide a broader overview and history of Pacific Islands in the global climate regime and discuss the unique role that Pacific Islands uh, play uh, driving a global norm shift regarding the use of fossil fuels in particular. I always like to start with the big picture to remind ourselves of the scale of the challenge that we face. Uh, it's not news to any of you of course, uh, but our climate troubles stem from the brute fact that every year we put around uh, 40 billion tonnes of carbon into uh, the atmosphere, this thin and fragile layer that uh, encompasses the planet that we're all on. And the impacts of, of, of this are becoming increasingly clear. Of course, climate change is often framed as a problem of our grandchildren, but we now know that that's not true. Uh, you can pick any point on the globe and any point in time, and we can start to see the devastating impacts of a warming globe are kicking in already. Here in the Pacific, of course, in recent years, We've seen the uh, strongest cyclones recorded, ever recorded, making landfall in, in Vanuatu and Fiji uh, with devastating effect. And our current dilemma though, is that our political leaders uh, are, are, have not fully grasped uh, the enormity of the challenge that we face. Uh, to give a sense of the challenge, I like to quote here from the Australian political scientist Robert Mann, who describes climate change in the following fashion. He says, there is nothing in history, even remotely as momentous, as what humankind is now doing in full knowledge of the facts, gradually destroying the habitability of large parts of the earth for humans and other species by burning fossil fuels in ever increasing quantities to meet our ever increasing energy needs. Judging by present behavior, our generation while living in unprecedented material comfort is leaving the task of adapting to an earth four or six degrees hotter than the one that existed before the industrial revolution to generations yet unborn. If nothing changes, our legacy will be a world of rising sea levels, droughts, floods, famines, furious heat waves of disappearing glaciers, coral reefs and tropical forests, of acidic oceans and mass extinctions. Unless it turns out through a miracle that virtually the entire cadre of world scientists who work in the area of climate are fundamentally wrong, the only people that future generations will be able to look upon with respect are those who saw the monstrousness of what we are doing and gave their lives to the climate cause. So the challenge that we face there is nothing in history remotely as momentous as what humankind is now doing. And climate change, climate change is, is, is at heart a problem of global politics. It is a pro fundamental problem of global governance 
And to tackle the problem effectively requires cooperative multilateral regimes that enables states to work together to tackle the problem, states and other, other actors. Global politics is obviously shaped by material power, by economic and military clout. However, ideas are crucially important as well. Political science and international relations scholars have long been interested in the ways that normative ideas reshape politics by framing what is considered legitimate and illegitimate behaviour or state behaviour. So a norm refers to a, a, a standard of appropriate behaviour and uh, international relations scholars have theorised about how norms change over time and here we can consider things like slavery uh, or, or the right to vote for women. In, in, in the past it was considered perfectly normal uh, that, that women did not have the vote but of course uh, as there was a global norm shift uh, this became illegitimate and, and uh, states of course adopted universal suffrage. So the, th the international relations theorists Martha Finnemore and Catherine Sikink they penned a particularly influential article in 1998 on international norm dynamics and political change uh, and this article provided, provides a theoretical framework for thinking about norm change in global politics. Uh, they contend that norm entrepreneurs help to get new norms onto the global agenda and at a certain tipping point a norm cascade occurs when new principles are embraced by a critical mass of states. They tend to then cascade through the international system. And Finnemore and Sikink, you know, they, they quite usefully provided uh, a, a figure. They, 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 they suggest that when around a third of states in the international system, um, but, and, and which includes particularly critical and powerful states, uh, embrace a new norm, this then becomes an unstoppable momentum that cascades through the system. They argue that this is a form of socialization within the international society of states and what happens at the tipping point is that enough states endorse the new norm to redefine appropriate behavior for states. So what we can see at the moment is that we are in the midst of a global norm shift regarding the use of fossil fuels as a source of energy. So for centuries it has been considered perfectly normal to dig up fossil fuels and burn them to provide energy for our growing economies. However, we now know with overwhelming scientific certainty that putting carbon into the atmosphere by burning coal, oil and gas will undermine many of the Earth's life support systems. And in the longer run of history, I think that we will look back at the 2015 Paris Agreement uh, and the times that we're currently living in as a key moment, as a global tipping point regarding the use of fossil fuels. So in the schema provided by uh, Sikink and Finnemore, we can see that we're around uh, this tipping point in the emergence of new norms in the, in the global system. And what role then for Pacific Island countries? Well, Pacific Island states, I argue, are playing a crucial role as norm entrepreneurs, pushing us towards this global tipping point that will undermine the perceived legitimacy of fossil fuels as a source of energy. Pacific Island states have long had a unique moral authority in global discussions about climate change, and they have deployed that authority in ways that have shaped the nature of the global climate regime. This has been a long struggle. Uh, when a relative scientific consensus around climate change emerged in the late 1980s, Pacific Island leaders quickly realised the threat that climate change posed. At their annual uh, meeting of leaders, Pacific Island leaders in meeting in 1991 argued that cl climate change represented a, cultural, a threat to the cultural, economic and physical survival of Pacific nations. And they stressed the urgency of a global agreement uh, with commitments for immediate reductions in the emissions of greenhouse gases. Unfortunately, a generation later, uh, 27 years later, Pacific Island countries continue to argue for 
exactly the same thing. But nonetheless, by framing climate change as an existential threat, Pacific Island countries have been able to convince other actors in the international community that climate change is a serious problem. And they have led the discussion. So in the early 90s, Vanuatu's first ambassador to the United Nations in New York, uh, Robert Van Lierop, he was a crucial actor. He helped to establish the Alliance of Small Island States uh, and AOSIS was consequently, as a group of small island states, uh, very influential in the design of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, in 1992 and it reflects some of the specific concerns of small island developing states. Uh, the UNFCCC itself provides a framework agreement for cooperation to tackle climate change, but it does not in itself require a reduction in emissions. But here again, island states led the way because almost immediately after the UNFCCC was formed, or uh, the the Pacific Island countries, uh, through the Alliance of Small Island States, proposed a new global treaty that would see uh, commitments, binding commitments for a reduction in emissions. And the first UN proposal for a multilateral approach, what eventually became the Kyoto Protocol, was drafted by Nauru when Nauru was the chair of the, when the Nauruan ambassador to New York was the chair of the Alliance of Small Island States. And then, uh, jumping forward in the story a little, after the Kyoto Protocol, the next major agreement in the global climate regime is of course the 2015 Paris Agreement. And here again, Pacific Island countries uh, proved to be crucial to securing a successful outcome. The Marshall Islands in particular, ably led by their foreign minister, Tony de Brum, were able to forge a negotiating alliance across traditional negotiating blocks at the UNFCCC. And this alliance, the so-called coalition of high ambition that emerged in Paris, was crucial for arriving at an agreement that was universally accepted. And, you know, this isn't just something that I, as an academic uh, based in, in Fiji, argue. Uh, it, we can look to the former US President Barack Obama when he met with Pacific Island leaders in late 2016 in Hawaii he explained to them that we could not have gotten a Paris Agreement without the incredible efforts and hard work of the island nations. So the Pacific Island countries at each major point in the global climate regime the establishment of the UNFCCC, the signing of the Kyoto Protocol and the signing of the Paris Agreement have been crucial for realising those outcomes. So what does the Paris Agreement mean? Uh, of course it's a major multilateral agreement, but the, the nub of it is the temperature goal. So it requires states to work together to keep the global temperature rise to well below two degrees. And in turn, that requires a massive transformation in the global economy. Recent research suggests that uh, between now and the middle of this century, each decade we need to see a halving of global carbon emissions, uh, which will be a massive task that we'll, uh, we will need to remove all subsidies for fossil fuels by 2020, end the use of coal as a source of energy by 2030, and end the use of oil by 2040. Uh, at the moment, of course, uh, there's a massive gap between the commitments that uh, states have put forward under the Paris Agreement and what is required to meet the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement. So there's an, an ambition gap. And so how are we going to get there? Well, the Paris Agreement, it, it builds in a mechanism by which we increase ambition over time. So there's uh, every five years, there will be a global stock take of efforts to reduce emissions. And this global stock take, it, ha it clearly has normative dimensions. Uh, this stock take uh, represents a political moment in which states will be asked to explain how their efforts to tackle climate change comply with new norms regarding uh, the use of fossil fuels. It is hoped that this, this process will see a ratcheting up, up of ambition over time. And it's through peer pressure and a socialization process 
that states who are recalcitrant will be brought, brought to bear. You know, the hope is that over time states will work together to uh, take charge of their domestic emissions to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. So what does the Paris Agreement mean for fossil fuels? Essentially, it means that 80% of known fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground. So uh, we need to begin to plan for uh, a phase out of fossil fuels as a source of energy. Uh, and we, we need to plan to be leaving fossil fuels in the ground. As Bill McGiven, the founder of the global climate organisation 350.org, explains, if we're serious about pre preventing catastrophic warming, uh, we, we simply can't be building new co coal mines, drilling any new oil fields, building any new oil pipelines, not a single one. We're done expanding the fossil fuel frontier. Our only hope is a swift managed decline in the production uh, uh, of the existing mines. So the Paris Agreement means that not only can we uh, not be opening new mines, but we must begin to phase out our existing mines and, and existing coal-fired power plants. The winds of change are beginning to blow. We're seeing major disruptions in global energy markets. Uh, over the past year, two-thirds of all new investment new energy investment has been in renewable sources of energy. For the first time, uh, investment in solar energy has globally has overtaken investment in coal. Uh, we're seeing states uh, make, send out strong signals to markets by announcing that uh, they will do things like uh, ban petrol and diesel vehicles in, at a future date or that they plan to phase out coal completely as a source of power at a future date. Uh, at the COP23 negotiations in Bonn uh, in November last year, uh, a new coalition of states was launched, uh, a new Powering Past Coal Alliance was launched, a global alliance intended, diplomatic alliance intended to see a phase out of coal as a source of energy. Unfortunately, however, a small minority of states in the global system remain wedded to fossil fuels. Uh, here in this part of the world, the wealthiest member of the Pacific Islands Forum, the largest and wealthiest member, which happens to be Australia, is also the world's largest coal exporter and uh, Australia plans to continue to promote uh, the use of coal as a source of energy by subsidising the construction of new coal mines. Uh, and states like Australia are especially disruptive of global efforts to reduce emissions as they pursue uh, their interests in promoting fossil fuel exports. So what are Pacific Island countries doing? Uh, Pacific Island countries are organising. Uh, we have seen amazing social movements bring together actors from across uh, 14 independent Pacific Island countries who have put themselves on the global stage and are demanding that for, uh, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change in Pacific Island countries, all states must move away from fossil fuels. Uh, Pacific diplomats are demanding greater ambition. Uh, in, uh, they are putting pressure on polluters, arguing if the rest of the world followed Australia's lead, uh, when Australia put forward their, their commitments to reduce emissions under the Paris Agreement, the, rest, the, the Great Barrier Reef would disappear and so would countries like the Marshall Islands. Uh, they're putting pressure on states like Australia, explaining that now is not the time to be debating the science or building new coal mines. Pacific Island countries are putting forward radical proposals. The Prime Minister of Tuvalu and the former President of Kiribati uh, Anote Tong put forward proposals for a global moratorium on new coal mines, which sounds like a radical proposal, but if we're to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, uh, it is exactly the sort of policy measures that are required. And Pacific Island countries are beginning to frame uh, these actions as, as, as possibilities to push the envelope. Pacific Island countries are leading the global conversation about how to tackle climate change. Uh, 
emblematic of that. The Fiji is currently the president of the Global Climate Negotiations and has, is in 2018 chairing a global Talanoa dialogue. Talanoa is a Pacific word that refers to a process of inclusive and participatory dialogue. Uh, and Fiji has rebranded uh, a global dialogue mandated under the Paris Agreement as the Talanoa Dialogue which is intended to take stock of collective efforts towards the Paris climate goals. And this will give the talks over 2018 a distinctive Pacific feel. Uh, this, the, the Talanoa concept refers to uh, a process of, of, of public conversations infused with protocols of respect which are a means of building mutual trust and settling disputes. In the Pacific, these generally very long public conversations are typically conducted in village halls, often around bowls of kava. While this might sound relaxed, a talanoa is not just an empty talk. By the end of a talanoa, everybody understands what the problems are and what needs to be done to solve them. In the context of the 2018 talanoa dialogue, the world will be asking what countries are doing to tackle climate change and what steps they are taking to move away from fossil fuels and particularly the dirtiest of energy sources like coal. So Pacific Island countries are again creating a space to frame the issues uh, and this Talanoa Dialogue will call out states that are not doing what is required to uh, move away from the use of fossil fuels. Ultimately, Pacific Island countries, I would argue, are crucial actors in the global norm shift away from the use of fossil fuels as a source of energy and are helping to bring an end to the fossil fuel era. So I'll stop there because I think I've uh, gone slightly over my allotted time and apologies for that. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to share my research and uh, some of my, my thinking regarding the role of Pacific Island countries in global efforts to tackle climate change. If anybody has any queries or would like to discuss these issues with me further, please don't hesitate to contact me by email uh, using the email that's on the screen. Thank you very much.